In this lecture, we'll be taking a look at the global archaeological record. It is, in a sense, part of the lithosphere, very similar to our natural soils. However, when we're talking about archaeology, we are looking only at material that in some way, shape, or form is connected to human behavior. In terms of human behavior, uh, elements within the archaeological record, again, that particular horizon within local and regional soil horizons that has in some way, shape, or form a connection to human behavior, in this case materials that are connected to human behavior, that layer will reflect things like uh, the extraction of energy from a local environment. So how do humans, or how have humans in a sense, been able to mine caloric energy from a local ecosystem? Uh, looking at things like the raw materials that they are gathering, looking at the particular kinds of uh, plants and animals that they are collecting or domesticating and storing, or what kinds of materials are being used in symbolic actions. We also take a look at generally uh, what is referred to as cultural material. So again, anything that is associated physically, um, or any physical material that is associated with cultural behavior. And then uh, anything associated with uh, death and decomposition, again, looking at human remains and their contribution to the natural environment. So in a sense, when we look at the archaeological record globally, we are looking at the impressions left behind, of the physical materials left behind, the effects on natural materials. Uh, that uh, represent uh, humankind and human history. So in a sense, the archaeological record becomes a stratigraphic layer. It becomes a strata, in a sense, that encompasses the entire globe. So in the same manner as a pedologist, as a soil scientist, an archaeologist will take a look at how natural and cultural sediments will develop over time. They do this in order to reconstruct the natural and cultural environments that are associated locally, regionally, even globally with the phenomenon. The methods and techniques that archaeologists use to be able to sample um, qualities of the natural and cultural stratigraphy of a region, of a local environment, uh, in a sense, are designed to be able to gather information and adequately reconstruct not only the past environments that people lived in, but the actual behaviors of people as they adapted to changing climate types and changing landscapes. When you have deep stratigraphy as we have in this diagram to the right of the image, you have to use very unique core sampling techniques where you literally uh, burrow deep into uh, covered sediments. Um, and as you're doing that, as you're moving deeper and deeper into these sediments, and these are, uh, these are cave sediments that are being um, associated with a timeline uh, in this image, uh, in a sense you are um, delving deeper and deeper into the past. One of the, one of the laws of stratigraphy, the law of superposition, is the idea that we have more ancient deposits below uh, and as we move closer and closer to modern terrestrial levels, we're moving closer and closer to our modern age. Uh, other things that archaeologists have incorporated into their analyses, and these are, again, things that uh, tie archaeology to physical geography, have to do with uh, oceanic changes. So archaeologists will take a look at things like oxygen, oxygen isotopes and their expression within seafloor sediments and how these isotopic expressions within the natural environment tell us something about how there is a pattern of global temperature change or in this case global, the global effects of things like glaciation. So in a sense, archaeologists today will utilize qualities of the natural record to be able to inform the cultural record. And what I mean by that is they'll, in a sense, take a look at what's happening in the natural environment, even on a global scale, to understand why people are adapting in a behavioral way uh, in the manner that they are. So in the sense, when we see a global rise in a phenomenon like agriculture or the domestication of plants and animals, what natural factors might be driving that process? So in a sense, we're looking at how 
technological changes as they are expressed in the human record, uh, how we are moving from different kinds of materials that are being utilized for specific kinds of tools or the, the actual tools themselves, their, their shape, their form, their use, how that's changing over time, how that is a factor of uh, what's occurring in the natural environment. Let's take a moment to look closely at this concept of stratigraphy. How, in a sense, we have natural stratigraphic layers and we have cultural stratigraphic horizons. This particular image is very much of a hypothetical um, example. However, it will give you a sense uh, of how these two records uh, overlap or interact with one another. So you may pause the lecture at this point and take a closer look at the image. Now let's take a closer look at one particular unique phenomenon within the ancient archaeological record or within human prehistory. And it relates to a cultural complex that's really known only by its technologies. Uh, it's referred to in this case as Clovis. Clovis or Clovis culture is associated or was associated initially with the Clovis point. Uh, the Clovis point was a projectile point that was discovered in the 1930s by archaeologists working in and around the landscape surrounding, in this case, uh, Clovis, New Mexico. Uh, Clovis, as we have studied it further and further, has become a phenomenon associated with both the peopling of North and South America. So in fact, Clovis has come to be related to a common culture type, which is recognized as the starting point for all North American, Native American cultures that we know of today, including the many languages that are spoken uh, throughout the Americas. So today we know, though, that this probably was not the case. We were probably dealing with um, several migrations and we were probably dealing with a wide variety of culture types that were in a sense uh, beginning to seed the new world. However, we are dealing with an archaeological phenomenon. The idea here that we do have a tool type, a technology in a sense, that is found throughout the continental United States at approximately the same time. Many of the Clovis sites initially are dating to somewhere between 11,000 and 20,000 years ago. Additionally, we have biological evidence that connects the indigenous peoples of both North and South America to this topic, the idea of how people got to the New World. What we realize when we take a look at things like mitochondrial DNA is that we're probably dealing with three, if not four, periods of migration. And we are seeing biological evidence that also connects the populations responsible for these migration patterns to Asia, uh, the Asian Pacific region, and then some mitochondrial DNA evidence, at least one strain, one variation of the mitochondrial D DNA phenomenon associated with this, connects a group of people to Central Europe. Even the dental research that is associated with human remains recovered from the archaeological record has substantiated uh, at least a good portion of what we recognize to be geographic points of origin. Uh, the work of Christy Turner and Rebecca Kahn are very good examples of this kind of, uh, this kind of research. Christy Turner's look at dental characteristics uh, specifically has recognized connections between East and Northeastern Asian populations and individuals uh, living in the Americas. So this particular phenomenon uh, that is cultural in nature, it's technological in nature, has really become a very important topic in the American School of Archaeology. Research uh, as early as 1890 and spanning through the new millennium uh, has in a sense placed this question of where the first Americans came from, in a sense, at the heart of, of many of the questions that are ongoing in, in terms of the research being conducted in North and South America. Another effect that this research has had is how archaeologists are looking at the natural environment in relation to understanding something about cultural history. 
by looking at a technology that, in a sense, becomes standard across North America at a very ancient time, prehistoric time in human history, we really have to engage the idea of what people are using this technology for, how it is helping them to ecologically adapt to, in this case, a late ice age or post ice age landscape. So not only does this archaeological phenomenon give us a better understanding of the Pleistocene epoch or the Ice Age, in this case spanning a period of time sometime between 1.6 to maybe 2 million years ago uh, to then approximately 10,000 years ago when we see the Holocene epoch begin. So not does, only does it give us a sense of what the natural environment was like at that time and the impact of glaciers, but then how humans were adapting to this unique natural phenomenon, in this case uh, migrating from the old world to the new world, and then of course developing new technologies to be able to adequately mine the energy that they needed from the natural environment as they adapted to a changing ecosystem. So the archaeological record, the global archaeological record, in a sense, will add another layer of understanding for us as we take a look at human beings, as we take a look at environments, as we take a look at landscapes and climates through, in this case, the lens of physical geographer. This will also be an important topic with regard to human prehistory to better understand how human beings have adapted to changes in climate. The final image that I have here for you to look at is something that, as I said before, we will be touching upon in our glaciers unit. But ultimately, when you take a look at this, you're looking at the really the greatest expanse of glacial ice, principally continental ice uh, sheets, associated with uh, North America. The physical and geographical interaction between the Cordilleran ice sheet and the Laurentide ice sheet are very important with regard to this topic. Um, the presence of an ice-free corridor is important to understand how megafauna and potentially the humans, the human hunting and gathering populations that were using them as an very important food resource, how they migrated uh, south into what is today the continental United States and then ultimately Mesoamerica and South America. So in a sense to understand the archaeological phenomenon of how people got to the New World, we have to better understand, uh, again through the lens of physical geography, the nature of global patterns of climate change, and in this case the Ice Age, and a period within the Ice Age in which we had the greatest expansion of global glacial ice.